Welcome to kinetics. In part one of this unit, we are going to be looking at factors that affect reaction rates and an energy diagram with delta H in it. Let's get started. So first of all, a reaction occurs. Well, one theory of why a reaction occurs is collision theory that says that reactant molecules must collide or hit each other in order for a reaction to happen. It's not good enough to have two reactants in two separate beakers, but you actually have to put them in the same beaker so that they hit each other and to react. The more effective of collisions that occur, the faster the reaction they'll be. So more collisions, faster reaction. The more molecules there are, or the faster they're moving, the more likely there will be enough effective collisions. So notice we've said effective collisions. So an effective collision is not only just some molecules hitting each other, but actually hitting each other to make a product. So in order for a collision to be effective, molecules must have correct orientation and sufficient energy. So for example, if you're playing Legos, you can't put the Legos together upside down or not on top of each other the right way, or they don't have the correct orientation, they won't make a Lego tower. You also have to have them give, give them sufficient energy. It's not good enough just to line them up correctly, but you actually, ha actually have to click them together in order to make a collision that is effective and will build you a nice Lego tower. So some factors that affect the rate of a reaction are surface area. Surface area affects the rate by allowing more reactant molecules to be exposed to one another, another increasing the chances for an effective collision. So for example, let's say I have a cup of water and I want to put a sugar in the bottom. And so let's say I use a sugar cube. So here's my sugar cube trying to dissolve in the water. Well, when the water hits the sugar cube, it's going to dissolve there, and it'll dissolve here, and it'll dissolve there, but it won't be able to dissolve right in the center because the center won't be able to touch the water. So not all of the surface of the sugar is touching the water at one time. But if I were to have some water with sugar in it, and instead of it being a sugar cube, the same volume of sugar, but sugar crystals all spread out. So all of those sugar crystals can touch the water all at the exact same time, and then the water can attack them and dissolve them and break their intermolecular forces and dissolve the whole thing. So greater surface area will increase the rate of a reaction. Next we have concentration. And concentration affects the rate by placing more reactant molecules into the same size container, thereby increasing collisions. So let's just say this time we're going to dissolve some magnesium in some hydrochloric acid. So I have a little strip of magnesium in both beakers, a little strip of magnesium in some hydrochloric acid. So in one of the beakers I'm going to put 3 molar hydrochloric acid, and the other I'll put concentrated 12 molar hydrochloric acid. So we're going to represent the 3 molar hydrochloric acid by three little red arrows attacking that piece of magnesium. And those will dissolve that piece of magnesium, let's say, in a bunch of water. But for the 12 molar HCl, now I've got 12 moles, and we're going to represent that by 12 arrows, attacking that HCl all at one time. 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. And so... How do you think, which one do you think is actually going to go faster or dissolve faster? The one that only has 3 moles of HCl in the 1 liter of water or the one that has 12 moles of HCl in the 1 liter of water? Hopefully you're thinking the one on the right should be faster. Next we have temperature. Temperature affects the rate by increasing the energy and speed of the molecules and therefore increasing the number of collisions. So if you had, again, a beaker of, let's say, a sugar cube. You really like those sugar cubes instead of sugar crystals in water. And so then water molecules are going to come and dissolve to attack this sugar cube. But if the temperature increases, then those molecules move faster. And the faster they move, the more likely they are to hit the sugar. So now they're going really fast, they're going really fast, they're going faster and faster and faster. And so those water molecules can dissolve that sugar much quicker because those molecules are hitting the sugar much quicker. Then we have a catalyst. A catalyst provides an alternate pathway for the reaction. So kind of like a detour, something completely different, a different way to get around it and it lowers the amount of energy required to get the reaction started, or the activation energy. A catalyst does not affect the heat of reaction. This means that a catalyst is a chemical added to change the way 
the current chemicals or the current reactants react. It doesn't change where it starts. It doesn't change which reactants you start with or which products you end with. It just changes how the reaction moves. And I'm going to explain that more a little bit on our next slide. So activation energy and activated complex, these are mostly just vocabulary words that you need to know. Activation energy is the minimum energy needed by a molecule to react. A higher activation energy means a slower reaction because there's more energy to overcome. So I have to get the reaction started in order to make the reaction happen. And the activated complex is an unstable transition state between the reactants and the products. It's formed at the highest point of energy in a reaction. Let's look at some examples of what I mean here. We're going to look at a fake reaction, which is a real reaction, but kind of fake the way I'm going to draw it. H2 plus Cl2 makes 2HCl, which on its own is a real reaction, but everything else from here on out is false just for demonstration purposes. So let's say we have an H2. I'm going to put that in a different spot. We have an H2. That's an H bonded to an H. And we have a Cl2. That's a Cl bonded to a Cl, and that's going to make 2HCl. An H bonded to a Cl, and another H bonded to a Cl. So let's say the very first thing that happens when we get an H2 and a Cl2 together in the same container is it connects right there. Let's say it makes a box. This would be called the activated complex. It is a transition state between the reactants and the products. So that's the activated complex. So first step is we connect them all to make a box. Second step is we disconnect the H's and the CL, CL's, and ta-da, we have the products. So that would be the mechanism by which the reaction happens, the order of steps that happens. So the activation energy is the amount of energy it took to get from the H's connected together and the CL's connected together. The activation energy is the energy it takes to get from here to here. Once it's got that done, then it can easily just erase right here and make its products. So there's my activation energy, the amount of energy it takes to get to the transition state, and the transition state itself is called the activated complex. So let's put a catalyst into the mix. We're going to go back to our original reactants the way that they originally were. And let's just say this catalyst is NAI, an ionic compound. So I'm going to put Na here, NaI. Now this is an ionic compound. This that I'm drawing right now is not the real dot structure for NaI. It's just for demonstration purposes only. So let's say NaI is a catalyst, and I add NaI to get the reaction started. So now I've got H2 and Cl2 and NaI in my beaker. So first step is... We connect them right here. So that would be an activated complex, a transition state between the reactants and the products. So then next step is we disconnect right there. This would be another activated complex, another transition state between the reactants and the products. Then the next thing that happens is we connect here and that will be another activated complex. And then the next thing that happens is we disconnect here and then connect right there. So now I've got my final products. Notice that my final products with the H's and CL's, they changed from the reactants. Instead of H2 and Cl2, I now have 2HCl. Notice that my catalyst didn't change. My catalyst started as an AI and ended as an AI. So the catalysts don't end up showing up in the overall reaction because the catalyst didn't change. It came back out the same way that it went in. So a catalyst doesn't change how you get there. No, it doesn't change where you're going. It only changes how you get there. Now it seems that this catalyst would make a reaction take longer but it all just depends on how much energy it takes to make the catalyst or to make those connections in the first place. It's possible that there's a lower activation energy for the Cl to connect to the Na than there would be for the Cl to connect to the H. So kind of like driving, uh, maybe you're going to take the shorter route. Say you're driving and you're trying to get from here to there. So all you have to do is drive this way. It seems like that wouldn't take very long. 
unless there's a whole bunch of construction on the road, and maybe someone else who went this way ends up getting there quicker, even though it seems like it would have taken longer since there's construction on the road and you can't get through, then it actually takes a shorter amount of time to go through a catalyst because the catalyst has a lower amount of activation energy. Let's see that on a graph. So we've got a graph of endothermic and exothermic, and we have energy versus time. We'll start with the exothermic graph. We've got energy versus time. So we start with the reactants. That's where my two reactants are. So let's say this is the H2 and the Cl2 over here at my reactants. So now the activation energy is how much energy it takes to get the reaction started to get to this activated complex. So remember, we're going to pretend like the activated complex is this big box between the H's and the Cl's. So that's my activated complex. Once it's made that activated complex, then it can easily turn into my products, which is my 2HCl. The delta H is how much energy it took to get from the beginning to the end, regardless of how it was that you got there. So if we were going to take a catalyst and add a catalyst into the mix, let me erase what we have. So a catalyst starts at the same reactants and ends at the same products, it just changes how you get there. So it would change what my activated complex is. So with a catalyst, we're going to start here with the reactants with the H2 and the Cl2. But my activated complex, it takes this much energy to get to this thing that was um, I, H, H, I, N, A, Cl, Cl. Na. So let's just say that was my activated complex, this big giant chemical. This chemical is totally non-existent. It's just a transition between the reactants and the products. And so that would be your activated complex, or what an activated complex is. And I'm going to erase it because it kind of looks crazy. Okay, so that is an exothermic reaction. It's exothermic because the reactants have more heat and energy than the products do. So overall... From the beginning, we are losing energy to get to the end, so we're giving off heat and energy, which is exothermic. Endothermic is the exact same thing. The activation energy is how much energy it takes to get to the top of the hill, and for a catalyst, the hill is shorter. The difference between exothermic and endothermic is that the reactants have less energy than the products, so overall it ends up taking in energy instead of giving off energy. Okay, and that's our Unit 1 Kinetics. Join me next time for Reaction Rate.